Good afternoon, everyone. Last week, most school districts voted on their budgets for the upcoming school year on town meeting day. And for this year, we're still looking at a roughly $90 million surplus in the education fund, as we forecast in December. Property tax rates were set for this year using the best information available at the time, which included a grim projection about the economy due to the pandemic. Fortunately, that projection didn't come true. And the numbers show Vermonters actually overpaid on their property taxes. So that means we have more money than needed to meet the budgets that were approved last year. I should note, this is still in addition to the roughly $400 million schools have received in direct uh, federal funding to use for things like air, fil air filtration and many other needs. As Vermonters are well aware, it costs a lot to live in our state, which has exacerbated other challenges we have, like our demographics. And property taxes are a big part of our affordability challenges. Typically, when you overpay for something, you get some of that money back. That's why I've asked the legislature to return about $45 million to taxpayers. To put this simply, if the legislature agrees with my plan, residential property taxpayers will get a check back for over $250 this summer, which could come in handy considering inflation these days. This rebate will be in addition to the $50 million tax relief package I proposed, which would provide ongoing relief to nearly 25% of Vermont taxpayers, from seniors on Social Security to working low-income families, those with student loans, nurses, and more. Now, we know there's no single policy or one bit of taxpayer relief that will solve our affordability crisis, but it all adds up. So when Vermonters give the government more money than it needs, they should get money back. Next, for the second half of the education fund surplus, because of our workforce shortage, I'm proposing we dedicate that to support career and technical education. I think most would agree, we need to do more to support CTE because they've been left behind for quite some time. As I discussed in my State of the State and budget address, it's important our kids know that choosing a career in the trades is lucrative, and we need more of them to choose this path. It's no secret we don't have enough workers, especially in the trades, which makes this a top priority. Secretary French will speak to the specifics of our proposal in a minute, but we have an opportunity to make historic investments in CTE for infrastructure, learning opportunities, and workforce training. I'm hopeful we can come to agreement with legislators on this shared goal. Lastly, a year ago, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan. As we move into the second half of the legislative session, I want to remind lawmakers how important it is to get this right. We agreed last year to make transformative, tangible investments in areas like climate change, housing, water and sewer infrastructure, broadband, and more. We simply can't squander this once in a lifetime opportunity. So I again hope legislators remember the commitments that were made and use this funding strategically to deliver the best returns and make sure that all 14 counties benefit. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. It is projected uh, the education fund will have a large surplus this year. The governor is proposing to return half of that surplus to taxpayers in the form of property tax rebate. The governor is proposing the other half of the surplus be invested strategically to expand the capacity of our career and technical education centers to address what is probably our greatest challenge as a state, our workforce development. Our CTE centers play a critical role in our education system and in the economic development of our state. Using these one-time surplus funds in a strategic way to expand the capacity of CTE centers can help us meet our current and future workforce needs. Simply put, investing in CTE is an investment in our future. There's a lot of interest in expanding CTE programming in the legislature this year. 
and we look forward to working in partnership with legislative leaders to advance this common goal. To help support these deliberations and the collaboration with legislators, the governor has put forward recommended strategies in the form of three investment priorities to, to use these one-time surplus funds. First priority would be to establish a $15 million fund to create a CTE construction and rehabilitation experiential learning program and revolving loan fund with the purpose of expanding the experiential and educational opportunities for Vermont CT high school and adult students to work directly on construction projects, including residential housing projects. This program would improve property values around the state while also teaching high school and adult students critical trade skills. This program would accomplish several goals, including create community partnerships with CT centers, housing organizations, government entities, and private businesses, beautify communities and rehabilitate underperforming housing and land assets, and expand housing access to Vermonters and communities throughout the state. The second priority would be to establish a $28 million competitive grant fund program for CTE facility and infrastructure upgrades directly tied to high need workforce areas. Funds from this grant program could be used for the expansion of CTE classrooms, supplied learning spaces, or purchasing new equipment to expand program access for additional students. Centers would work with their local advisory boards to identify the high need workforce areas in their regions to guide these investments. The third priority would be to use $5 million of the Ed Fund surplus in two areas to support the development of just-in-time rapid deployment training opportunities, and second, to support the development of innovative workforce training programs. $4 million into $5 million would be directed towards the just-in-time training programs to assist CT students, secondary and adult, in mastering the skills for Vermont's high-need jobs in the trades and in healthcare. Examples could include summer training programs, an extended year of high school as a pre-apprenticeship apprenticeship experience, and training boot camps or other intensive training programs. The remaining one million would be available to support innovative ideas in CT centers to support workforce development needs where there might be a critical need for training at the regional or state level and where additional funding may be needed to support these types of innovative programs. Together, these three priority proposals represent about $48 million in investment in CTE programs and workforce development. Vermont's workforce needs are, are perhaps our most critical challenge right now, and these strategic investments in CTE can act as a catalyst support, to support the expansion of the workforce now and into the future. Lastly, I thought I'd provide a quick update on changes in our COVID recommendations for schools. Those new recommendations go live on March 14th, as we announced last week, and are part of a broader strategy to have schools operate under the same health recommendations as the rest of Vermont. Dr. Levine will provide an update on these recommendations in his comments in a moment. This week is a week of transition for many districts as they plan to implement the new state recommendations. Several districts have announced that they are going to move to mass optional earlier than March 14th, so we've been engaging a lot with districts as they're trying to make that transition. We are hoping uh, the shift in mitigation recommendations will free up capacity in schools to focus on critical education recovery work, which includes utilizing the federal relief dollars that we have at the state level to help them with their local needs. This recovery planning has kicked into high gear at the state level, and I will have updates on this work soon. I expect our focus will be in two areas in particular this spring, one, addressing the academic and learning needs of students, and two, uh, supporting the social and emotional needs of students and staff. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to start out by thanking our state epidemiologist, Dr. Patsy Kelso, for speaking to you last, at last week's press conference in my absence. She's obviously one of the many, many people in the health department who have stepped up to shoulder a great deal of work to help us navigate the pandemic, and I owe her a debt of gratitude. As we've noted for many weeks now, the COVID-19 situation continues to improve both nationally and in Vermont particularly when it comes to the important measures regarding severe illness and disease. 
<clears throat> the CDC has reinforced the need to use metrics that focus on severe disease as we plan for the future. And Vermont as a state is seeing very low hospitalizations and impacts on the healthcare system related to COVID illness. We're well protected against severe disease through vaccination, have more immunity in our population from infection, have ready access to testing, and treatment options are available for those at higher risk. With lower risk of severe illness and the tools available to protect Vermonters, we are preparing to update our public health guidance. It will reflect these new realities and help us live safely with fewer COVID-19 disruptions in our lives so we can focus on recovering from the setbacks caused by the pandemic. As we've already previewed, Starting Monday, March 14th, the decision to wear a mask will be up to each person based on their own circumstances, personal risk assessment, and health needs. This will mean something different for everyone. You may feel ready to take off your mask indoors, or you may decide to keep wearing it due to your age or a health condition, or to protect someone at risk from more severe illness. Or maybe you're just more comfortable keeping it on during this transition time. I want everyone to know that's totally okay. It's okay to be cautious and make these decisions at your own pace. And I ask everyone to be supportive of these personal choices and not judge anyone who chooses to keep a mask on. Remember, it's still a good idea to keep a mask with you as some places you may choose to go may still encourage or require them. I urge you not to throw these masks away and while you're at it, hang on to your home test kits as well. As much as we've learned about this virus, we also know it has the ability to quickly change and we must remain prepared to meet those changes if we need to. Now also on March 14th, we will simplify our isolation and quarantine guidance. <clears throat> if you test positive, you will need to stay home and isolate for five days. If you are a close contact and not up to date on your vaccines, you do not need to quarantine, but you should get tested. Testing is still recommended if you have symptoms or an exposure to COVID-19. We'll continue to urge Vermonters to stay up to date on their vaccines and boosters to be as protected as possible. The science is clear on this and I urge you to follow it. We'll also continue to conduct surveillance for disease trends, monitor outbreaks in vulnerable populations, and be on the watch for new variants. I again ask Vermonters to make sure you know if you are at higher risk for COVID-19. Not only will it inform whether you take extra precautions, it's also critical to accessing treatment quickly through your health care provider if you do test positive. The list of health conditions that could put you at higher risk continues to be updated, so consult the CDC list or talk to your health care provider if you have questions. It's the same conditions that may have put you at the front of the vaccine line that will apply, and more have been added to the list over time. You can learn more by visiting the treatment page of our COVID-19 portion of the uh, web page at the health department. I'll finish with a few quick words about the White House's Test to Treat initiative announced last week. Test to Treat is just what it sounds like. People will be able to get tested and if they are positive and treatments are appropriate for them, they would receive a prescription from a healthcare provider that can be filled in one location. These one-stop locations would include pharmacy-based clinics and federally qualified community health care centers. It's a very interesting model of care. However, we are not yet aware of any pharmacies in Vermont that are eligible. And the federal administration has not yet let any of Vermont's community health centers know that they are part of this program at this time. 
There is a possibility this could happen for at least one in the near future, if the site so desires. Meanwhile, as the initiative develops, and we will keep you informed, the majority of Vermonters will still be able to both test and receive prescriptions for treatment at their primary care practices or other health care settings. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. all of that 90 million into schools and kids uh, instead of giving some back? Well, I do think that the taxpayers deserve a return. Um, they overpaid, and I just think it's just a, the right thing to do. Some might argue you should give all of it back to, uh, to taxpayers, but I thought that there was something that we could uh, agree to in the middle, um, returning half of it uh, to taxpayers as well as making the investments in workforce that we know we need. Uh, CTE centers um, have been uh, pushed aside and neglected, I believe, uh, for decades. And, uh, and they're not um, treated the same as the rest of the education community, I don't believe, or haven't been. So I think we need to change that, put, some, uh, put our money where our mouths are and, uh, and try and invest in, in an area that will give us a, a great return. What would you like to see get, get across the halfway point and also budget adjustment? I know you had had some concerns of some of those, those pots of money where those are being spent. So where, where, what's the latest for that? Yeah, I still have concerns with the Budget Adjustment Act, um, but not enough uh, to prevent it from going through. Um, my biggest concern, uh, obviously, is the, uh, where they're spending, where they're getting the money. Uh, for budget adjustment, we went in uh, using a lot of the surplus money that we had from uh, this current fiscal year uh, that is going to be substantial. Uh, they're using a lot of the ARPA funding that I believe we should use for strategic transformative investments. Um, now, that could all sugar off in the uh, bigger bill that's coming out uh, at the end of the session, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, the other provision uh, that I have a problem with, I mean, there's many, but the million and a half dollars uh, they're using of ARPA funds uh, to design their new cafeteria in the State House. I think that that's uh, something that's uh, not on the priority list from my perspective, and uh, that's going to lead that million and a half dollars just to design uh, a new cafeteria is going to lead to about 25 or 30 million dollars of uh, ARPA money or some money spent on something that I think could be utilized in other areas. Do you mean the, the proposal to potentially build another floor on top of the cafeteria, that redesign? Is, well, is that what they're mean? actually building a cafeteria, right? I mean, the floor, they're, they're talking about using uh, the existing eating area uh, for um, more committee rooms, I believe. So they're actually building a new cafeteria. Dr. Uh, if I could, uh, the, uh, the test kits we were just talking about, um, most of those test kits now, I believe, have a, um, a use-by date of June or July, I believe. Uh, and I'm just wondering, can they still be effective after, after those uh, born-on dates? As you <laughs> I'm not sure it's as straightforward as you're presenting it in terms of when you're looking at hundreds of thousands of test kits, which ones are Right. I'm just slated. looking at the groups of, of test kits that came out. I know when I picked up mine, they were, they were good till June. Uh, the ones that just came out uh, and were delivered this past week from the federal government were right around July. Um, of 2022. Of this year, yeah. yes. So I was just curious. Yeah, I do know there was uh, talk at the level of the FDA about if those uh, expiration dates actually could be extended because of the fact that nothing is going wrong within those kits that would prevent them from being accurate later on. I don't have an update on that, unfortunately. 
Um, I do know that the federal government has just uh, given Americans another opportunity to get several more test kits for their family. Uh, so I would hope that if those are coming in April that they don't expire two months later, clearly at a time when the pandemic will have really receded and uh, we want to save them for a future time if we need them. Is there a way to find out one way or the other that those will be, that will be able to extend past the... Yeah, uh, uh, I, I would have thought we would have heard from the FDA by now, but let me have our office look into that. Also, um, just wondering uh, with the legislature uh, proposing a bill uh, to really treat legislators and people in government um, different from uh, the general public as far as uh, stalking and a few other uh, harassment issues. Uh, if, is that a good idea or should we be just strengthening the law altogether? Well, I'm not... Uh you know, I think any any issues uh, surrounding stalking of any sort um, should be uh, is reprehensible, and and I think that we should do all we can to prevent that from happening. If we're talking about, and I haven't looked at the specifics of this one, um, but um, but if we're ta talking about treating uh, legislators or those who are holding office um, in a higher to a higher standard or or treating them better, um, that that doesn't wouldn't work for me either. I think that uh, everyone should be treated the same. I heard some backlash on that. That's why. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't read the language yet, to be honest, though. Governor, also in your opening comments, you alluded to inflation and the higher cost of, well, you said gas, but right now certainly lots of people are paying at the pump. In, in some states, um, there has been a kind of evolving discussion of potentially temporarily rolling back the gas tax or, or lifting it temporarily. I don't know if Commissioner Bolio is on the line or if you want to comment. I mean, is that something that, that you look into? You know, we need to do all we can as a country. We're not just facing this as a state. Um, we need uh, some revenue uh, to match the federal funds uh, so that we can build the projects and keep the infrastructure uh, in, and, and improve the infrastructure in our state. Um, and that would only give us temporary relief. We're not talking about a lot of money. When you, when you combine, I think it's about 28 cents or something like that uh, per gallon. That's not going to, I mean, we've seen uh, the price of fuel uh, go up uh, dramatically, uh, far exceeding the 28 cents. So um, I don't think in the long term that's going to help. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm sure on the, on the national level, um, they're looking to do whatever they can to increase production uh, to take uh, at least temporarily uh, to try and take uh, some of the impact away from everyday taxpayers. But this is, again, uh, difficult. We saw the before um, the uh, Putin war on Ukraine began. Um, I think that the, uh, we were already seeing the prices of fuel increasing due to inflation, supply chain issues, and so forth. Um, since then, it's uh, increased dramatically and it may increase more, but it's the price we may have to pay uh, for freedom and for democracy and to do all we can uh, to condemn the actions taken by uh, Russia and Putin in particular. Uh, Governor, the president today did cut us off from Russian oil. That's um, a good move, by the way. I think everybody kind of agrees with that, but what he didn't do was increased production on the on the U.S. side. He said he would negotiate with our other suppliers, uh, the Middle East, uh, Europe, uh, and and such. But he did not say anything about, you know, opening the spigot here. As far well, again, as this is a little bit out of uh, my area of expertise, uh, but uh, but I think we should do everything we can uh, independently to take care of the U.S. And if we can increase production, um, and and we're currently, I believe, at one point recently, we're the highest producer of, uh, our, of uh, fuel, and, uh, and so we, um, if we can do that to get us through this hump, we should. But on this, at the same time, I think this really does emphasize our need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, I think that uh, the electrification of, of vehicles is the future. 
and we should accelerate that just as quick as we possibly can so that we can be truly energy independent. Uh, so we don't have to rely on the rushes of the world or the Middle East or, or any other country for that matter. We should, we should be able to stand on our own two feet. And, uh, and so maybe there would be a reduction in conflicts as a result. I think this war, uh, this war uh, this, uh, on, on Ukraine, I think some of it is about dominance, world dominance, dominance of the fuel industry. Uh, natural gas and, and gas uh, in, as well, uh, petroleum gas. So I, um, I think, again, we can do two things at once. Uh, we should increase, in, from my humble, in my humble opinion, increase production here in the U.S. Uh, if we can to get us through this uh, period of time, but also double down on, uh, on trying to invest in the technology uh, to uh, to reduce our emissions as well as to uh, become more energy independent with the electrification of vehicles. Last question for Dr. Lee. Would you care to comment on Florida discouraging healthy children from getting vaccinated and Governor DeSantis chiding students for wearing masks in schools? <clears throat> if I could paraphrase the uh, governor's response last week about a Texas policy. Um, Vermont is not Florida. <clears throat> Our perspective continues to be, and this joins the perspective of the pediatric community at large, that vaccination is the most effective way to prevent serious illness and worse outcomes. This is an essence um, of why we call many viral illnesses vaccine preventable diseases. The word is preventable, and it's in healthy people that you want to prevent these things. Uh, so what the Texas governor, sorry, the Florida governor and surgeon general of that state basically announced was um, that um, healthy people, specifically children, don't need to get vaccinated. <clears throat> I was also troubled by the, uh, the governor's comment re discouraging students from wearing a mask. <clears throat> um, because students uh, who have so chosen to wear a mask uh, wanted to be able to do so. Um, now, Vermont guidance is shifting to people determining their own risk and taking into account their own personal circumstances and those of their loved ones around them and the people around them. So berating kids who are trying to make the choice that is either best for them or for those around them is not a very sound public health policy and probably not a good parenting policy either. All right, we'll move to the phones, starting with Wilson Ring, AP. Um, hi, everybody. As always, thanks for uh, being so accessible. Um, this is for both the governor and Dr. Levine. Um, it seems that this week sometime is the two anniversary of the original state of emergency that came with COVID. And I know that uh, COVID was looming for a while before that actually came into place. But I'm wondering, two years later, uh, would you ever have imagined that you as Vermonters and you as public officials would have had to have gone through what ha you have gone through. And what lessons do you think that you have learned here, both as uh, or as human beings and public leaders? Well, <laughs> uh, first of all, I think uh, if you look back two years to March 13th, when we I signed the order uh, uh, stating um, um, an emergency declaration here in Vermont. I never expected that it would last two years. Not that the uh, state of emergency has lasted, but I didn't think the pandemic was going to last two years. But at the other, on the other hand, I don't know if any of us uh, knew what to expect. Um, and um, I think the lessons learned um, from my perspective is that uh, understanding we don't have all the answers individually, uh, that we continue to have to learn from others. Uh, we were able to watch other states. They were, some of them, 
uh, were experiencing uh, the pandemic before we were, so we were able to avoid some of their mistakes. Um, we also um, started uh, these, uh, these press briefings. Um, when we've had, you know, over the last two years, I would imagine well over 100, 150, maybe, maybe more, I don't know. Um, but we leveled with Vermonters and we tried to tell them what was going on. We were truthful uh, with them and uh, giving the good news and the bad. But we also, uh, as a team, we worked together uh, to listen to the science, watch the data and make decisions on what we thought was best collectively uh, for Vermonters. And that wasn't always popular. Not everyone agreed. Um, but, but again, we tried to uh, be forthright, uh, transparent, and explain that uh, to Vermonters. So I think if, um, if there's a lesson to be learned um, from my perspective is uh, just give as much information as you can, um, but, but do what you think is right, uh, not what is politically right, uh, not what, is, uh, what people are, are asking for all the time, but do what's right based on the information you're receiving and, and rely on the health experts to give you that information. Dr. Levine. Yeah, this is a amazing time that it's two years later. Although, it, as you point out, it's actually way more than two years from all the preparatory work and anticipation. I think, um, <clears throat> Certainly one thing we learn as a human race, I think, should be humility. And what I learn in a scientific way and in a medical and public health way is humility. Uh, because this is, again, something no one had encountered in a century, uh, a pandemic of this proportion, and a virus that had never really been around to infect human beings before. And we still don't even know exactly how it got to human beings, though uh, the theories are getting further honed. So <clears throat> um, I think relying on science, relying on data, would have been something that I would have thought was a natural thing for most people to embrace. But as we've seen, we live in very polarized and divisive times as well. So. One of my lessons learned is the power of powerful leaders and others uh, in providing misinformation, making it all the more important for political and public health figures in this state to be as true to the science as possible, true to the data as possible, and as uh, hopefully full of integrity and transparency as possible. One of the basic tenets of public health in situations like this is frequent and obviously accurate um, communication. And as the governor said, not only telling people what they want to hear, but sometimes telling them what they don't want to hear, but that they have to hear. And I think that's an important lesson that we all need to take into consideration as well. The reality is um, this is um, a cause of stress across the world and certainly in our country and we need to understand that and continue to be understanding of what that stress has done to people. At the very basics it's gotten people into arguments and uh, polarities about masks are good, masks are terrible, vaccines don't work, vaccines are life-saving um, and we need to sort of navigate those waters uh, and try to be understanding of people who aren't on the same side of the fence as us. We also need to be incredibly thankful that we live in a state where the majority of people have been aligned with us completely all along the way, which has been really a wonderful, wonderful aspect of this. Um, but when I refer to the stress, it's also what we've been referring to in the numerous press conferences of late, which is, we are taking the focus off of this virus that is receding for hopefully a longer than a moment into the background and now dealing with all of the impacts that it's had on our population. 
and you've heard about some of the education impacts many, many times. Also impacts on our overall health, on our overall health habits and lifestyle habits, on uh, numerous, numerous uh, aspects of our existence. So I think we need to be very humble and realize that we have a ways to go to now uh, engage in what we call recovery and revitalization and get ourselves uh, pointed in the right direction and hopefully with some unity and getting there um, without a virus sort of lingering in our minds all the time, impacting uh, every move we make and every action we take. So um, that's not probably doing justice totally to your question, but that's uh, about it for now. Okay, thank you very much. Ben, the Valley Reporter. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Secretary French. Um, so at this stage in the pandemic, you know, we've been talking about the social and emotional health of Vermont students. How, or what exactly are some specific uh, measures that you're going to take towards addressing these? Yeah, hi, Ben. I, I think I heard your question around social emotional well-being in schools and what specific measures we're taking. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think it's useful to think about this in two levels. One is uh, what we're going to do at the state level and what locals can do, is that's essentially how uh, the dollars are deployed. Um, so we have state level resources that can be deployed to address uh, the issues of education and recovery, of which social emotional well being is a priority. Um, but there's also local funds as well. And kind of our challenge, and this has been how we've had to navigate all of our response in education as a result of the federal uh, funding, is we have to do our best to coordinate both the state uh, investments and the local investments to have the biggest impact. So, and you know, we've been delayed in doing that to a certain extent because we've had to navigate uh, various, uh, the variants of the virus, so to speak, and there's limited capacity uh, for us to really have a focused approach on both recovery and uh, doing the daily uh, hard work of ensuring our schools are safe from COVID-19. Uh, that being said, I think first thing is to acknowledge that one of the most important things we've done already this year is that we maintain our schools open through perhaps some of the most challenging moments in the pandemic in spite of the two-year uh, cycle you heard about a few minutes ago. Starting this fall, <clears throat> our high schools have largely been operating continuously, which was not the case last year. Uh, most of our school programming uh, went forward. And that's a tremendous achievement considering the context that we're in both with Delta and Omicron. But now, as Dr. Levine mentioned, as we see the, the, the variants sort of fading, uh, we have our work cut out for us and we need to renew our interest in making a focused effort on addressing the impact of the pandemic. So at the state level uh, right now with our state funds, we're talking in partnership with our Department of Mental Health um, about focused strategy relative to well-being in schools. And I think that's gonna play out around two things. One is to actually deploy uh, more clinical resources to schools, uh, but the other would be a focused uh, strategy on staff well-being, uh, because we need our staff uh, teachers um, fully able to uh, do the work that they're so great at doing on a daily basis and that they've been adversely impacted by the pandemic, to say the least. So that's, that's kind of a, in a nutshell where we are at the state level. Um, I think at the local level, what we're anticipating doing is really re um, putting some emphasis on something we call education support teams, uh, which have been a longstanding education policy in the state going back some odd 20 years. Uh, we want each school, each school district to have an educational support team uh, focused and beginning to uh, say take referrals or to do the assessment around what student needs are and also serve as a interface between uh, local resources and state resources. So as we bring state agencies to bear to help out school districts and so forth, uh, they can have one point of interface at the district level as opposed to one at each school level. So this is kind of where we're at at the moment. Uh, we'll have more uh, explanation of this as we're going forward. Uh, but the good news is we're starting to you know, get out from underneath the sort of the public health aspects that have dominated a lot of our work in schools. And we are able to sort of now really put some focused effort on the education recovery work. Thank you. Aaron, BT Digger. Hi, um, I 
believe that I, I think this question um, would probably be for Dr. Levine. I was wondering for the mask, um, new mask guidance that you guys are putting out, uh, do, does it apply to congregate facilities like long-term care, healthcare settings, um, you know, con um, incarcerated individuals, in places like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the, the guidance that we're putting out is really under the rubric of general population guidance. Uh, both the healthcare sector and the long-term care sector have guidance coming from CDC and from CMS, and um, they need to be attentive to that, as they always are. <clears throat> Having said that, um, even the guidance coming from there is really focused on uh, recovery, if you will, and on maintaining good visitation patterns, maintaining um, you know, good infection control practices, of course, but not being so overly restrictive that we adversely impact the mental health of people working in such facilities. So um, they will go under their guidance, though. Uh, and with regard to corrections, uh, our corrections uh, department has been uh, formulating uh, more renewed plans um, for, again, um, returning to a uh, time when visitation policies and uh, restrictiveness uh, can be revisited uh, as, as appropriate to the circumstances on the ground at those settings. So their guidance does not come under the general population guidance either. Okay. Um, I also have a question about the schools. Um, maybe Secretary French would know better than you, but, you know, we'll see. Um, what is the status of testing in schools at this point? Um, is it still regularly happening, and is it going to be continued through a certain time period, or are there plans to wind it down at all? Yes, we both know the answer to that, but I'll give Secretary French his opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, you're, you're talking about COVID testing in schools? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that is simply antigen testing or sure. if you guys still are performing any level of PCR testing, but I was thinking of kind of yep. both initiatives. Yeah, I just want to make sure you weren't talking about SBAC uh, academic testing. Um, in terms of um, COVID testing in schools, we're maintaining our current programs, which are twofold. Uh, we call test at home. Uh, you know, in both, I should say, both programs rely uh, on antigen testing, rapid tests. So test at home is still being maintained for the time being, as is what we call staff assurance testing, uh, which is, you know, basically to provide staff uh, ready access to antigen tests uh, so they can uh, maintain a, an awareness of their own status relative to the virus. So what we announced last week is that uh, those programs will be fading out over time. Um, I think we'll start to see that happen around April 1, sometime in that time frame, but it's not certain at this point. And very similar pattern to uh, our mitigation recommendations in that um, we're going to be moving uh, the testing towards a statewide approach as opposed to a specific strategy for schools. So in the background, there'll be uh, increased supply of antigen tests coming into the state from the federal supply. Um, and we'll be seeking to phase out the specific school program in favor of a larger uh, testing initiative available to all Vermonters. Okay. Um, just by the way, did you ever get that list of um, highly vaccinated schools throughout the state? Yeah, it's something we're working on. Thank you for asking. Um, <clears throat> you know, we had the week of vacation, uh, so we weren't able to make much progress on that because our intention was to uh, send the information to local school districts first. Uh, so that's what we did on Wednesday of last week. Uh, so we're in the process of just pulling that together. So we'll have some reporting on it soon. Okay, thank you. Hey, Governor, I had a couple of construction questions for you. We're just about to enter the season, and this is sort of the near wheelhouse. Um, there's a lot of money available, of course, for construction, and the industry has actually been doing about as well as any, any industry through the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of money, but not a lot of workers. What are your expectations as we ramp up the new, the new construction season? Um, my expectations are we're going to have more projects than we have uh, entities to construct them. Um, we're 
you know, having this unprecedented amount of uh, federal dollars coming into the state uh, for a lot of infrastructure. And uh, we have our traditional uh, funding as well. So this is going to put a lot of stress uh, on us uh, as, uh, and, and those uh, in the industry as well. Um, we also, at the same time, are experiencing uh, a lot of um, supply chain issues. Um, so I think we're going to uh, have to have some tolerance uh, in terms of how long some of these projects are going to take. We may have to ask the federal government to extend uh, the time period because I, I don't believe we're alone in this. Uh, as I keep talking about and I've talked about over the last six years, uh, we have a workforce uh, challenge on our hands. The demographics are proving themselves out. Uh, we were heading in that direction before the pandemic and the pandemic has, has exacerbated uh, the issue. So we, we don't have enough people in the trades, as I said in my opening remarks. So um, this is all leading to, um, we're going to, it's gonna take some time um, to, uh, to put all this into place, but, um, but that's a good problem to have as uh, opposed to not having enough money to do the projects in the first place. So again, this is gonna be challenging um, but uh, we'll work our way through it. As far as the CTE funding is concerned, uh, there, I've sent uh, three kids through the high school, and you've experienced with this as well, of course. And there's there's three things, three issues. One is is convincing the kids, convincing the parents, which of course is vital. And then there's, there's always been a transportation issue since there's you know. It, for most of the students, they'd have to travel to the to tech centers. Um, how do you address uh, those issues, and where do you see the the money that you want to spend on it going to? Yeah, again, um, I think that uh, sums up what some of the challenges have been, and that I think CTE uh, has been viewed as an afterthought uh, by some, but I hope it's on the, the forefront. I hope. Uh, that we can reduce uh, and eliminate uh, the stigma attached to uh, CTE uh, schools and uh, those who enroll. Uh, because I, I said in some of my remarks, some of the most successful people I know uh, came from the trades. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's, a, it's a lucrative career. Uh, and I think we need uh, to at least engage uh, more kids so they understand the opportunities that are out there. Uh, and uh, the success they can have in doing so. Um, maybe Secretary French can go through what we actually want to use the CTE money for, uh, but, but I will say um, uh, the sooner that we can destigmatize this and, and put this into um, uh, you know, a more a congregate setting, uh, from my standpoint, uh, the better off we'll be. Uh, so they aren't separate units, that they're all uh, interrelated in some capacity. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, I'd make a few comments, and specifically on the proposal of the Ed Fund. Uh, the governor's remarked that you know CT centers have been left behind to a certain extent. I think that's definitely been true uh, pertaining to uh, COVID relief. You know, most of the COVID relief dollars that have come in uh, to all states come to school districts. And that isn't necessarily a good alignment with the uh, funding for CT centers. So we've had to work, and the governor's had it as a priority. Uh, we had another uh, very small, relatively speaking, pot of funds called the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds, and those have been largely dedicated to CT centers. But uh, there is a significant need uh, not only to address the COVID-related costs for them, but also, uh, again, to, to make a strategic investment in the future. And I think... CT from an educational perspective and a workforce perspective should be leveraged to the maximum extent possible. And to your, your point, Tim, I think about this idea of um, eliminating barriers is a useful one. Uh, we have several other policy uh, proposals in, in play with the legislature. Um, we should be looking at structural barriers that prohibit or prevent or make it difficult for kids to attend CT programs. Uh, one, for example, that we're working on with the legislature gets at the structural issues of how CT is funded. Um, there are some essentially financial disincentives for schools to support students uh, attending the centers, 
and we want to work to eliminate that and essentially fund CT right off the top of the Ed Fund. Um, so we, we had a study that was done a year ago on that, and we have an interest in taking that forward and actually trying to operationalize that in the coming year. I think another issue, to your point about students, uh, you know, the logistics involved of attending the different CT centers, um, I was down at the Stafford Tech Center in Rutland uh, earlier this year, and uh, I was a superintendent of that area, but I, I wasn't surprised to find that uh, they're basically trying to manage the academic programs from 12 different sending high schools. And each of those high schools has different curriculum, different standards, different proficiencies, if you will, and that's really challenging, and it's a, it's a fundamental structural issue. Uh, we would like to see, uh, I'm hoping to pilot uh, the use of remote learning technologies for the academic portion for CT centers uh, so the students could spend more time in the centers uh, and less time on school buses driving back and forth between their uh, sending high schools. So anyway, those are a few ideas, but I think you're on track uh, that we need to look more aggressively, I think, at eliminating some of the structural barriers that, that make it more difficult for students to access these programs. All right, great, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Pete Hirschfeld, VPR. All right, we'll try Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, this question is for Governor Scott, and um, it comes from a reader who is insured by United Healthcare, which is ending its current partnership with UVM Health Network at the end of the month. They would like to know if you or you and your administration are able to do anything to help resolve the differences between the two organizations and short of a resolution is it any way you can bring to bear some sort of postponement so that it does not happen till the end of the year when people can openly and can open enrollment is available i might ask if uh secretary samuelson is on the line and might be able to answer that better than me yeah thank you for the opportunity to answer that question, so we are currently evaluating the situation um, that is occurring between uh, UV, the UVM Health Network and United Healthcare, um, and what options we have. Um, we are going. We are strongly encouraging um, UVM and United Health uh, to work through their challenges and differences. We recognize um, that both of the, these providers provide a significant footprint in Vermont. In terms of our actual next steps um, that we're going to take related to this, we'll have to get back to you uh, in the in the future. But again, um, really working to uh, watch and monitor the situation on the ground um, and encourage the, the providers to um, really get to consensus so that we can continue to provide adequate treatment in Vermont. So I'm not sure if Mike Pichek, uh, Commissioner Pichek, if you have something to add to that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Secretary Samuelson. I just want to, you know, echo Lisa's point. It's certainly a concerning situation. Um, it's obviously having an impact on Vermonters now, even though um, the contract doesn't end till the end of the month. There's a great deal of anxiety about uh, what this means for them. But we do want to reiterate that the negotiations are ongoing, that the parties are speaking to each other. Um, as Secretary Samuelson said, we're coordinating uh, internally among the state, uh, we are hoping and urging the parties to come either to a long-term agreement, and if they can't do that, to reach a short-term agreement that will allow uh, these individuals that are impacted to find alternative uh, health insurance. So we will uh, continue to monitor closely. We're meeting with the parties. We're trying to do all we can to uh, get to a, a favorable resolution. Thank you both for that. Is, does the state have any regulatory authority to pause an insurer to stay in the state through until open enrollment? So because of the type of insurance that's offered here, the state unfortunately has very limited authority, uh, very limited mm -hmm. regulatory authority. These are regulated plans at the federal level. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still play a role in trying to get to a resolution. So. 
uh, that is the role that we're playing. I uh, also want to mention any consumers that are concerned about the impact they are, uh, we encourage them to reach out to our department uh, to have conversations about uh, alternatives, to have conversations about the, the actual impact and to get information about um, what their options are. But again, hopeful that a resolution will be reached. Great, thank you very much. Colin Flanders, seven days. Hi, thanks. Um, Governor, I was, I was curious if you could give us an update. I know it's only been a few days, but last week you had said um, you had asked the state treasurer to review and liquidate any investments Vermont has in Russia, and you also asked your administration secretary to halt any purchases of Russian goods and terminate contracts with Russian entities. Have you um, been briefed on any movement on that? Have, have, have any, has anything happened on that um, so far? Are you still in the exploring phase? Yeah, it's still a work in progress. Um, I don't know if um, uh, Secretary Clauser has anything to add to that at this point in time. I have not heard back from the treasurer, but I know she and her team have been working on this as well. Thanks, Governor. I don't have much to add. Um, we are looking into all of our contracts. Um, the Office of um, Purchasing is looking into the, their contracts and reaching out to contractors to determine whether or not we have Russian, Russian sourced goods as part of any of those contracts. But I don't have any definitive numbers to provide yet. Some of the challenges, Colin, is that um, uh, you have to do some research in terms of which products actually uh, have Russian, um, I, I guess, roots. Um, some of them we may not even uh, consider, uh, like uh, I think it's Nikian Hakapolitas, I believe, are manufactured in Russia as well as in maybe Finland. Um, but, um, but I don't know where the entity is owned. So. Uh, that's a pretty big item coming into the state, um, but also do we purchase any of those for our fleet vehicles, for instance? So it's a, it's a, a bit of a, a painstaking process uh, to go through that. Um, you know, every commodity uh, would have to be researched. So um, it's going to take a bit, but, um, but if we encounter any, we'll uh, uh, certainly um, have to research that and then and then we'll be able to, to tell you what we come up with. Great, okay, thank you. And then just one quick question about the um, your proposal to return the $45 million in property taxes. I think you had said along the lines of $250. Would that be like $250 per taxpayer or is that an average? In other words, would it be prorated based on what you paid or is this just a blanket $250-ish check to every every residential taxpayer? Yeah, um, Commissioner Bolio, are you on the line? I'm here, Governor. I'm happy to take that one. Uh, so the governor's proposal would be a flat amount to each homestead filer. So that's based on property, and it's usually by household. It might be you know a single person, it might be a married couple, it might be a family. Uh, but the proposal is to do a flat amount, which would be somewhere between 250 and 275 dollars uh, per homestead parcel in the state. And the reason for that, Colin, is just simplicity. Um, it would be too difficult uh, to go through every um, every uh, uh, tax paid, so to speak, and, and then take a percentage and so forth. So we just thought it'd be uh, much easier if we just had a a uh, one um, one check uh, written to everyone. Great, thank you, Chris Mays, Bennington Banner. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I know you touched on this a few minutes ago, but I want to go back to it for a minute. Um, in Washington, there's been talk about a federal tax holiday to alleviate some of the effects of, of what Americans are seeing from the war in Ukraine. Uh, federal tax uh, rate for a gallon of gasoline is 18.4 cents. Vermont collects another 30 cents. Uh, I, I suspect that everyday Vermonters would, would see the combined 50 cents as a, as a big difference, especially for those who are 
struggling to make ends meet, and especially for those in rural Vermont who have to travel for work a lot. Um, you began today by saying that you know affordability is is a big issue for you. Would would you support uh, a gas tax hiatus in the state of Vermont, especially considering that you know we're going to be seeing a, a large windfall of federal funds coming for infrastructure? Yeah, I, um, as you probably know and have researched, uh, I have a lot of proposals uh, to reduce the cost of living on everyday Vermonters. I'd like to see the legislature take those up um, because that would be very, very helpful, I believe, and, and help the most vulnerable. Um, I would entertain anything uh, in this regard, but, uh, but again, I just have to caution, we still need to match federal funds uh, unless uh, the federal government is this, was to say, uh, you don't need a match uh, in order to move forward with any of these uh, uh, transportation projects because if we don't have the money to leverage, we don't get the money to do the project, and uh, and that may not uh, and they may not be um, advantageous uh, for us either. So again, it depends on the details, uh, but uh, but I'll certainly entertain anything um, to try and alleviate uh, some of the pressure. But I think we just have to be very open and honest about this um, this this war uh, this war uh, this invasion on a peaceful nation by Putin and Russia uh, is going to have a devastating effect and in, an in increase uh, cost not only to, to Ukraine which is horrific um, but the cost of living um, is going to increase here the cost of fuel is going to increase and we have to bear that cost. We, we, um, there's just no getting around that. And, uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll entertain anything. We'll see what the uh, federal government does. But, uh, but again, I, I think they might be able to take some measures as well to, uh, to try and increase some production for the short term to alleviate some of the pressure. Thanks. Um, the other thing I have for you today is, uh, it, as you know, this is Sunshine Week, uh, a week that highlights transparency in all levels of government. Um, your administration over the, the years has uh, done a number of things to, to reduce transparency, including uh, blocking BACs or blood alcohol contents in, in DUI arrests from from VSP troopers, uh, publishing that in press releases. and. And even even though that is public record later on, um, so Governor, I'm, I'm wondering um, what you would or your administration is actively doing to improve government transparency. Well, we're having press conferences uh, every single week and standing up here for sometimes two to three hours answering your questions. I think that's being pretty transparent. Um, I uh, I think that uh, we've tried to, to do everything we can. I think there is some privacy concerns in a lot of uh, cases, um, so that may be uh, some of the rub uh, with uh, with the media and with you in particular, uh, Greg. But um, but we we do feel uh, that private citizens are entitled to, to some privacy. Um, so there's a, there's a you know fine line uh, there, and we try and do the best we can, and we try and articulate why uh, we take some of the. Uh, the stances that we do. Okay. Yep. I totally understand that answer. Just you know, like in the case of the DUI arrests, that was a uh, that was something that was uh, uh, switched from the previous administration. So just uh, one of those changes that your administration has reduced transparency on. Just for the record. Okay. That, that's it for me. Thank you, Greg. All right, we'll move to Guy Page from Mont Daily Chronicle. Uh, hello, Governor. In Senate Judiciary this morning, Senator Benning voted no on the S-30 compromise bill approved by your legal counsel. Uh, he expressed his concern for a provision that allowing courts to remove guns from a household without the due process of being able to make a case before a judge. And he said, uh, I'm gonna quote, it's a precedent setting that I fear for the future will be a stepping stone for other cases. 
Now, I'm just I'm wondering why didn't this concern about due process uh, not keep you from uh, saying no to that part of the compromise bill? Well, first of all, I didn't. Um, this wasn't my bill to begin with. As you know, I vetoed the bill. I don't know if Senator Benning brought this up during the first bill. I don't know if this was, is this something that was added to the bill, this new proposed bill? Yes, I, I, I believe it was, yeah. Okay, so if it's something that's added to this this bill, um, I am i haven't, I just don't know that much about it and we'll see. I, I, I was pretty clear in, uh, in the veto letter, uh, what I expected uh, to change if they were, uh, I, I presented a path forward, uh, and if they don't adhere to what path that is, what I had uh, laid out, then I would probably be opposed. But, but again, if this was part of the original bill, then I would expect uh, that uh, Senator Benning had um, brought that to light earlier. I, I just hadn't heard about it. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, uh, Commissioner Levine was talking about uh, uh, pharmacies, doctor's prescriptions, treatment for, for COVID-19, and I, I, I may have missed it, but I wondered if, was, was he talking about that it's now okay to get uh, treatments such as ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, have, have these standards been relaxed on that, or is that still a uh, verboten as far as the federal government, the pharmacies, and the, and the state's concerned? Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, the test-to-treat program from the federal government um, does not include the drugs that you mentioned. Uh, it includes the newer antiviral drugs, Paxlovid, Molnupiravir, and any other new pills that come out and are shown in an evidence-based fashion to be effective at treating COVID and preventing serious illness. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you, good afternoon. Uh, a question for Secretary French. I'm interested in the pivot to academic recovery I'm wondering um, if AOE yet has um, enough data to be able to describe the scope and impact of lost education from the pandemic. I mean, are you able to, to either qualify or quantify, you know, a, a fifth grader today is, is, you know, a year behind or a year and a half behind, that kind of assessment? Yeah, thanks for the question. We don't at the state level have that kind of data. Uh, the only statewide, um, statewide academic assessment that we have is the SBAC, uh, Smarter Balanced Assessment, which is given once a year in grades three through eight largely in math and reading. Um, the year before, uh, the assessment was canceled. Uh, last year, it was implemented uh, with some waivers, and particularly a waiver on uh, participation rate. So we don't have good data at the state level necessarily. Um, we are going to be working directly with school districts to, to have them leverage their local data. Most of our school districts do have some form of benchmark assessments that they use, particularly at the elementary level. Um, and that's an area where we'll have to focus uh, a bit to ensure students are on track with their, their sort of foundational skill development. Uh, at the older grades, uh, you know, high schools will have some information, I think, around course taking patterns and have some idea of students' progress towards meeting graduation requirements. I think the, the challenge academically is gonna be uh, probably for the middle students uh, who were transitioning some so from that elementary sort of benchmarking approach to the high school course taking. And uh, these are gonna be areas where we're gonna be operating where we don't necessarily have good information at the state level. And we'll have to uh, decide to what extent we try to implement some new data uh, metric or to what extent we just focus on providing, providing those supports directly to schools so they can intervene. Is it your um, uh, expectation then that a, a greater grasp of, of these impacts on a, on a more granular basis is available at the schools? I mean, are you hearing anecdotally that superintendents and principals are pretty dialed in on, on this? Or, you know, is, are, are, are we still in the shadow of the variant surges and, uh, and that shift in thinking hasn't yet happened? 
Yeah, I think I think the shift has started at the beginning of the school year, but certainly uh, people's energies appropriately were directed at managing the public health concerns. But again, I think it's a tremendous accomplishment and a credit to our staff and the schools that we've maintained as much stability as we did this year in terms of keeping schools open. Um, but we do need to uh, put new emphasis on addressing the impact of the pandemic. And, um, you know, I am optimistic that we'll be able to do that. Um, you know, it's a question of how, how best to manage, again, the sort of balance between providing those direct supports versus measuring what the need is. And we have to do a bit of both. And, um, you know, we expect, for example, from a strategy perspective, to make greater investments in after school programming and summer school programming. Uh, as we did last year, those programs largely had a uh, engagement or social focus. I think going forward, we'll put renewed emphasis on those systems for academic purposes. So the, the basic strategies we can put in place, I think, are knowable, but it's a question of how we measure the impact, um, which is still an open question. But I think schools are very much involved in those conversations right now. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for tuning in, and we'll see you again next Tuesday.